All right. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for sticking around for the last talk of the conference. Um, I'm Lot. I just finished my master's at the University of St. Andrews, uh, working with Will in the Moore Lab. Um, as the title says on the tin, really the, the point of this work was to try and figure out what is causing the out of phase AMS response in a specific set of magnetite rich igneous rocks uh, that we were looking at for a different project. Um, so in very quickly, what is out of phase AMS? Um, AMS for people who haven't worked on it is an isotropy of magnetic susceptibility and it's a measure of, it's a way of quantifying magnetic fabrics. Um, and the way the AMS measurement works is you apply a, an alternating current field, so an AC field on your sample and you observe how the susceptibility changes as you rotate it through this field. Um, the vast majority of AMS is, is working with this in-phase component, which is, means that there's no time lag between the applied field and your um, AMS response. But this uh, recent uh, new machine from Agico, the KY5 Kappa Bridge, uh, can, they say that they can decompose the AMS response into an in-phase and out-of-phase component. And this out-of-phase component is a phase that is uh, that lags behind the applied field. And so you can mathematically deconvolve the two and get uh, an independent in-phase and out-of-phase response. Um, and really kind of what, what spurred this project is we saw that in a lot of situations our in-phase and out-of-phase response, the confidence slips has overlapped with each other. Uh, and in others, they were quite distinct. And in both cases, or especially in this case, they're really tight confidence ellipses. So we thought there might actually be something to it, but there's not been much in the literature, so it's really quite poorly understood exactly what is causing out of phase AMS in real samples. Um, so for that, um, in more detail, out of phase AMS is really caused by three different processes. Uh, the first one being electro eddy currents. So if you have something that is highly conductive like native copper, um, you and you apply a magnetic field onto it, that'll induce an electric field in that, and that will in response produce a magnetic field with some time lag. Uh, so that causes quite a weak out of phase response, but it isn't a very common thing in geological samples. So for the purpose of this study, we've ignored it because we don't have any native copper or graphite or other conductive materials in our, uh, in our rocks. Uh, the second type of material is, uh, or the second type of source is viscous relaxation. So this is under normal AMS measurement conditions, this is caused by superpower magnetic slash single domain magnetite grains right around that boundary. Um, and it's caused by uh, a lag in the amount of time required for the magnetite or for the sample to um, reach its magnetic equilibrium state after the applied field has been removed. Um, and notably because, uh, because the out of phase response in this situation depends on uh, the frequency that you measure uh, the AMS width, it's a frequency dependent response. So you'll get a different magnitude of your out of phase response depending on the frequency that you're recorded in. Uh, the final type of uh, source that you have is weak field hysteresis. And so weak field hysteresis it occurs exclusively in ferromagnetic phases like magnetite or pyrotite uh, and is, the, is caused by the nonlinear dependence of um, the uh, magnetization to the applied field in, fer in certain ferromagnetic phases. Uh, and because it's, it's something relative to the applied field, it's a field dependent response. So as you increase the field, it should change your degree of magnetization and therefore susceptibility. And because AMS assumes that there's a linear relationship between the magnetization and your um, applied field, your susceptibility, the AMS response that comes from weak field hysteresis has an apparent out of phase lag because of that. Um, so for this, we, uh, but why is it, why is it interesting to study out of phase AMS? What, what's the, what's the point of, of even considering it as a, as a useful tool? Uh, first of all, it's really controlled exclusively by ferromagnetic grains. And in most geological samples, this is the case, unless you have some kind of copper or that kind of thing. Um, and because of that, it could record distinct magnetic subfabrics. And that could be really useful to try and study sec secondary processes or to try and study really what is occurring at the, the, the micro scale as opposed to macro scale processes and igneous intrusions, for example. And what, I, what, what particularly drew me to it was, is it 
possible to record late stage remobilization of melt using out of phase AMS. Um, where, as an example, if you have a cumulus framework, could you potentially record a fine grain population that would have crystallized out at the time that these remobilization could be occurring? And especially, could that be, for example, compaction driven? Uh, so the sample set that we used to, uh, to work on this is on the same Young and Giant Dye complex that Rory spoke about earlier, so I don't have to give too much context on it. Uh, we took 22 samples and we took the you know, mineralogically the easiest ones to do. So the troctolites, which are a plagioclase rich gabbro, and these are magnetite, multi domain magnetite dominated, um, and that's what drives the in phase AMS response. There's no other ferromagnetic component in observing the petrography. There's no evidence of any texture anisotropy. So it's really quite a simple uh, study. It's quite a simple sample set, and we should assume that the um, that magnetite should in some way contribute to the out of phase response as well. So if we look at what we get in terms of our in phase and out of phase, so you can measure the in phase and out of phase simultaneously using this KOI5 Kappa bridge. And we find that there's really three main in phase out of phase relationships that we see. So the first one is you have a parallel in phase out of phase response. So in this example here, you have the K1, K2 and K3 axes are, are roughly parallel to each other. And this most likely means that they're caused by the same magnetic carriers. So in this case, probably we suspect it might be some, or our hypothesis would be that this might be some weak field hysteresis causing the out of phase AMS, which means that it's caused by largely the multi-domain magnetites and therefore recording the same process as the in phase AMS. In some other samples, we see an, a perpendicular in phase, out of phase response. Um, and this suggests that there's probably some kind of mineralogical control on our AMS response. Um, and this might mean that there might potentially be a, a single domain component, which might cause, say, viscous relaxation to be a more serious contributor to our AMS response. And especially that might be causing our out of phase response specifically. And so this might mean that, hey, a, out of phase AMS could be used as a way to, to, to test whether you have a, a, a normal or inverse AMS fabric. And the last one we have is we have an oblique in phase out of phase response. So this might actually be where, or this is the case where the K1, K2, and K3 axes of our AMS tensor um, are completely oblique to each other. There's no clear relationship between the two. And this might mean that, hey, the out of phase response is actually measuring a completely different magnetic subfabric. And this is really kind of what was the gold nugget that, that, that caught my attention with this project. Um, so we wanted to test. What, whether these hypotheses are true, is there some cases weak hysteresis? Is there, uh, is there viscous relaxation or what's really the cause of the, the out of phase AMS in here? Um, so we did several different characterization experiments. So the first ones we did were field and frequency dependence tests. So this is a quick and easy way to assess whether we have weak field hysteresis or um, viscous relaxation as leading the, the magnet or the, the susceptibility response. Um, and then we did some follow up remnants experiments and hysteresis experiments to, to really try and characterize the samples very well. And it'll become clear in a second as to why we did these secondary experiments as well. Um, so just taking a subset of our uh, results, if we look on the left here, we have the field dependent magnetic susceptibility experiments. And what we see is that there's a linear increase as we increase our field strength to our susceptibility, which means that there's a nonlinear dependence of the um, sample to the applied field. And therefore we have in all of our examples, and you're gonna to have to trust me, like in most conference talks that all of my samples had a field dependent response. Whereas if we look at the frequency uh, experiments where we, we zapped it with a low frequency field and a high frequency field, we see that there's no more than, a, uh, it's less than 1% in all samples, the, the, the difference between the low, field, low frequency and high frequency. So we've interpreted that as being a frequency independent response because it's almost within the, the error of the machine. Um, and in that case, all of our samples should have, um, should be a weak, driven by weak field hysteresis or the out of phase response should be driven by weak field hysteresis and not viscous relaxation, which kind of goes against what we, what we initially hypothesized when looking at the um, in phase and out of phase response, which is why we wanted to do some further experiments to try and see, is there uh, maybe a, a uh, hidden factor that is that that we're missing here, or is it potentially that the the just the sheer volume of multi-domain magnetite is is masking uh, a secondary 
population, a magnetic population here. So we did a set of remnants experiments and really what we see um, when we did the SRM, BRM, you can like, we've color coded it. Obviously there's a, a little bit of uh, picking as to what exactly is what group, but we can, I've picked it into four different magnetic groups. They're a bit less clear when you compare them in the, the ARM acquisition AFD curves. Um, but essentially we see that there's, a, there's groups that have lower coercivity, there seems to be an intermediate group, and then there's a group with higher coercivity, uh, grain, um, a higher coercivity population. Um, we follow that up with a series of whole, a whole series of other experiments. We have some TX experiments, hysteresis, um, and three component and fork diagrams. And really that, that seemed to confirm that there are indeed four different groups of uh, magnetic um, properties that we have in our samples. Uh, the first one up here being the least coercive and they continually increase in coercivity towards here. And really it's quite clear to see in three component demagnetization that we seem to have an increase in the proportion of a 0.3 Tesla component as we move across. Uh, and even in this group four, we seem to have a one Tesla component being present as well. Um, and then likewise in the fork diagrams, we see as we go across that the, the, the peak seems to be migrating along the x-axis. So there seems to be an increase in a, in a, in a higher coercivity sample, um, uh, a higher coercivity population as we increase groups. So then we said, okay, hopefully then this is an explanation as to why we have a difference between the in-phase and out-phase response. There should be a correlation between these groups and the in-phase and out-phase groups. And when we plot these against each other, when we plot these against each other, what we see is, is at best a very loose relationship between the magnetic characterization groups that we, I just showed you and our in-phase, out-phase relationship. So these are our parallel, our perpendicular, so our normal, our inverse and our oblique responses. And when we look at parallel, potentially we could say that there seems to be a decrease in the amount of parallel um, fabrics as we increase the coercivity of our sample. And we've interpreted that increase in coercivity to be this, this, this higher coercivity population being some form of single domain magnetite being present in our rocks. But as we look at perpendicular or oblique, there isn't really a clear trend there. So really what this is saying is there isn't we haven't really figured out what exactly is causing the out-of-phase response. So, so really to conclude and tie that all together, there's again, a, a very loose relationship between the amount of say single domain magnetite, if that's the right interpretation in a sample and it's in-phase out-of-phase relationship. Uh, it doesn't appear likely therefore that the proportion of multi-domain versus single domain or super paramagnetic magnetite alone controls this relationship. Um, and a possible reason that uh, that we can that we came up with is that potentially this might be that viscous relaxation has a much stronger out of phase AMS response, resulting in a disproportionate influence of it on it out of phase AMS. But it might be masked in our our characterization experiments because of the sheer volume of multi-domain magnetite that leads to this weak field hysteresis response as well. So ultimately, really, the nature of out of phase AMS is still unclear and and. Kind of the, the point of this this talk is there needs to be further work done on out of phase before we can really use it as a proper petrographic um, tool. Thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Lots. Um, we have a comment in the chat which says it would be interesting to apply for PCA to characterize those groups of samples. So here we are. I. I Hope someone would ask that. Um, so I've done some fork PCA, and uh, we so we use a method that that Richard Harrison created and use some of his standards to really test whether our model was valid or not. And we there seems to be a, a small increase in the amount of modeled single domain in our samples, but I. I I would hesitate to, to say confidently that this is not just a, an error within within our model, um, but this most likely is me being very naive in the way I've, I've created this model. This is still very new to me. So any any help or any insight in that would be greatly appreciated. I'd be, yeah, I'd be happy to take a look at it. But yeah, good. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. We have two questions in the chat as well. Um, one is, what is the level of conductivity in the sample Simmons to start to see at the out of phase response? Would salty water and porous bases be detected this way? 
That is a great question, and I would be I would lie if I came up with a, a, a an answer to that that I felt confident in as well. Um, I would I mean I would say you, you need some you need sufficient conductivity in the sample to to induce this this electrical current and therefore a response magnetic field that is strong enough that to be within the the um, sensitivity of the machine. So I'd say it would be it would need to be quite conductive, but I, I appreciate that that's a very qualitative response as opposed to a quantitative answer. All right. Um, and then they're also hoping if you could um, clarify what specific frequencies you use to establish your frequency independence and how your choice of frequency level influence the results. Yeah, so this is a good a good question. And I think I think we used I think it was 330 and 1200 Hertz. Um, so we the, the the I think that was the range we used, but I, I might be mistaken. Um, this was work done in collaboration and admittedly still quite new data. So uh, I'll get back to you on that and respond to that in a second. All right, and it seems we have a question from Greg as well. Hi there. Um, so I've got a, a kind of couple of quick questions. Are, are you actually able to quantify the, the phase shift, the phase angle between in phase and out of phase? Uh, and you know, is there any relationship with your rock mag, or can you use that to make some predictions of, of what you'd expect to see if it was a purely relaxation response, for example? That, that that's a, a good a good question. You can um, you can get uh, the 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 phase difference between your in phase and out of phase response, and in these samples, they're they're pretty consistent, being about ten to fifteen percent, um, and um, or, or sorry, 0 0.12 to 0 0.15 SI units, and um, the whether whether you can use that to 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 determine whether it's viscous relaxation or um, or weak field hysteresis, for example, is something that uh, I think would be doable. But the the way that these are decomposed in uh, using the the software that's provided with the machine is rather ambiguous. So it's it's if if possible, it's something that I, we I can't do with the the means at hand. Um, and and the other thing that I thought might be useful is have you thought about trying to do. Uh, fork decomposition. So instead of just measuring your standard fork, you can you can actually measure or calculate uh, an induced uh, fork diagram. So essentially looking at the infield effects only. I wonder if that might actually give you some more uh, more insight into what's going on with respect to to, to AMS. Uh, no, I've I've not thought of that. That that does seem like an interesting uh, possibility. So I think we, we should we should chat about that in the in the gather town at some point as well. Because yeah, again, uh, forks are something that's, that I started at the very end. So it's something still quite new to me. So, uh, but thanks for that. Um, it looks like we just well have two brief comments. One, Will has just mentioned in the chat that the frequency work was done on the MFK Kappa bridge. Um, I think that was in response to the frequency questions, but also there's a comment that says the nonlinear relationship between field and induced magnetization results in departure of anisotropy shape from an ellipsoid would be great if um, Agnico could provide the 320 directional measurements so it could be contoured onto a stereo net. Um, Completely agree. <laughs> um, but yeah.